Well, thanks. Thanks very much. What we'll try to do over the next 25 minutes is I'll give you a whirlwind tour of radiotherapy and cutaneous lymphoma uh, covering the past 20 years or so. I have no disclosures. So one thing that we need to realize immediately is, is that cutaneous lymphoma, first of all, is not one disease. It's probably 20 to 30 diseases, all with different natural histories and different clinical presentations. But the other thing you need to understand is that it, it's extremely rare. And some of the data that I'm going to review with you is not going to seem very impressive because the patient numbers in some of these studies are not high, but that needs to be tempered by the fact that there are only a couple thousand cases of cutaneous lymphoma diagnosed in the United States annually. So in terms of epidemiology, just mycosis fungoides, which is the most common type of cutaneous T cell lymphoma, and we can really think of these diseases as broken down into T and B cell lymphomas. But you can see how unusual this is. There's a slight male to female predominance. Uh, slightly higher in African Americans, but there are no proven etiologic factors. Cutaneous B cell lymphoma also is very rare, again, more common in men, but more common in whites, which is different from mycosis fungoides, but this is all cutaneous B cell lymphomas lumped together here. They're various subtypes, and again, we don't really have a clear etiology for this. And this is just presenting some of the same information more graphically. And you can see these increases, and this is probably based more on enhanced detection, correlation with more literature on these subjects. I'm not really convinced that actually CBCL, for example, is um, more prevalent necessarily. So I think that's really a detection bias. So in terms of classification, this has really evolved over the last 20 years, really evolved a lot in the last decade. Primary cutaneous follicular center cell lymphoma, marginal zone lymphoma, diffuse large B cell lymphoma leg type, these are a variety of markers in immunophenotyping that we would use to help make these diagnoses. And this is jumping over to cutaneous T cell lymphoma. We can see that there's a group of disorders that are considered indolent and then those that are more aggressive. And again, I want to point out that mycosis fungoides right here is by far the most common type of cutaneous T cell lymphoma, and that's going to be the basis for, for the cutaneous T cell data that I'll review clinically. So in terms of radiotherapy and targeting these cells, fortunately they home to the skin, and we can see that these cells with a Pautrier's microabscess, which is really something that's a classical pathologic finding for mycosis fungoides, resides in the epidermis, so it's a very easy target for us from a radiotherapy perspective. So this is one of the things that's complicated. Not only are there many diseases in cutaneous lymphoma, but this is just an algorithm and a slide that was borrowed from John Zick, looking at all these different therapies, all the different stages, and keep in mind that all of these patients will present with many, many different clinical presentations, so it can be very complicated. And I think that that's something that a lot of clinicians can actually be turned off on because it's a very complicated set of diseases, but for some who are uh, interested, uh, it can be very challenging and intriguing. And as you can see, electron beam really spans this spectrum. So there's a lot of opportunity for treatment with radiation. When we think about therapy, we divide it into skin-directed versus systemic, and we can see a variety of skin-directed therapies here. All of these are effective, but I want to point out that radiotherapy is the most effective by far of all of these. So local electron beam radiotherapy can come in several forms, electrons or photons. Generally, these lymphocytes undergo an apoptotic death. And we have superficial, orthovoltage, electrons. But as far as the cells are concerned, they can't appreciate the difference between these methods. What these methods really allow us to do is treat to different depths inside the patient. But typically, we'll have a CAT scan, for example, or clinical examination. We'll decide on the depth we want to deliver the radiotherapy to with a margin of two to four centimeters radially. This is the front of a brochure that I designed six or seven years ago. Uh, as many of you know, Yale is a major international referral center for patients with cutaneous lymphoma based on the expertise of my medical oncology, dermatology, and dermatopathology colleagues. And so we have many patients who come here from other states and sometimes other countries for total skin electron beam therapy. Uh, most of the patients in the Northeast actually come to Yale for this treatment. So total skin electron beam therapy, it's technically extremely challenging. It's excellent for those patients refractory to other disease methods. We have excellent rates of local control for those with mycosis fungoides. And it's a treatment that's been around, actually, for a long time. The Stanford technique, which is what we use here at Yale, was described in 1960. And Yale's one of the two busiest centers worldwide, the other is Stanford University. And we have a linear accelerator dedicated to the treatment of these patients on a daily basis. So 
about six or seven years ago, I designed these droid figures because I was a little tired of publishing pictures of patients with black lines over their faces. And these are the six positions that patients stand in to receive this therapy based on the Stanford technique. And you can see that the reason they're in these positions is so that we can unfold the skin to the greatest extent. I, with assistance from graphic artists, design these droids. I want to point out that there's nothing about the physiques of these droids that resembles myself, with the exception of perhaps this area. <laughs> so total skin electron beam therapy at Yale. There are a variety of different ways this can be delivered. These are two different methods that we've used over the years. We used to have a single field technique, but we had a flood in our department in Hunter in 2001, and we had to get a new linear accelerator. So since 2001, we've been using a dual field technique. And one thing I want to point out here is that there is an extremely low x-ray contamination of about 1%, which is critically important, because if you have a program with x-ray contamination that's in the 2 to 3% range, we can start to see bone marrow toxicity in these patients. I get a CBC at the beginning of therapy for these patients and we don't repeat it. We have no bone marrow toxicity whatsoever in these folks, which is obviously an advantage um, because they don't get uh, sick in a systemic type of way. This is just a graphic demonstration, 380 centimeter distance. Uh, patients are in the standing position, so that's one thing. Sometimes it's very, very difficult for an elderly patient to stand. They have to stand for somewhere in the five to seven minute range. Uh, again, that'll include treating multiple fields, and I'll go into the fields in a second. So this is a depiction of what it would be like if we aimed a static singular beam at a patient versus a combination of six beams. And again, this total skin electron beam therapy is, developed, is delivered sorry, with six different beams. So you can see we have an excellent dose right on the skin surface, which drops off very rapidly because there's no reason to give any uh, radiotherapy to structures that are one to two centimeters under the skin, for example. We're just aiming at the skin, although the lymph nodes and some of the blood pool are innocent bystanders, and that can sort of be a free advantage of this technique. So we do a fair amount of shielding. We shield the eyes externally for 22 of the 36 days of treatment. We use internal eye shields. They're sort of like metallic contact lenses for 14 days. The lips are shielded. The ears are shielded as needed. We have lead mitts uh, and nail covers, which are used to shield the hands and mitts. Uh, hands and nails, sorry, and there's 18 cycles total. So the hands are actually shielded for half the treatment. You might say, well, why are you shielding the hands for half the treatment? They're going to be underdosed. And the reason for that is, is when the hands are up in this position, the electrons can actually penetrate through and through since the hand is so thin. So we have to do a fair amount of blocking to make sure these areas are not overdosed. So we use what's called 120 kV x-rays, which is just a superficial x-ray device to boost the perineum in the soles of feet, since these areas are undertreated with the patient in the standing position. And you might wonder about the scalp. But we have a reflector in the top of that lattice setup that I showed several slides ago, so the scalp doesn't need a supplementary boost. These are the response rates with radiotherapy alone. T1 disease, for example, is a patient with mycosis fungoides who has patch plaque disease covering less than 10% of the body. T2 is greater than 10%. T3 is a patient with a tumor or multiple tumors. And T4 is whole body erythroderma. And we can see that the response rates are really excellent for the patients with early stage disease. But let's look at toxicity. Patients acutely can have pruritus, epilation, desquamation, uh, hypohydrosis, xerosis all get erythema of the skin. Some patients will get lower extremity edema. Bullet can develop blisters, and sometimes these blisters can actually be enormous, 10, 15 centimeters in diameter. And often the nails will become dystrophic and sometimes can fall off. But fortunately, that is not painful for patients, and they do always come back. More chronically, we can see atrophy and telangiectasia as part of that picture, dryness of the skin, alopecia, which is usually temporary. Uh, at least with our program, fibrosis, and second dermatologic malignancy as possible. So cutaneous T cell and B cell lymphoma questions. Impact of precursor lesions on prognosis, does this make a difference? How do we do with localized therapy with RT, just to a singular group of lesions that can be encompassed in one field? How about second malignancies? Extent of T3 disease, we have T1 and T2 for less than or greater than 10% of the body surface area. But when you have tumors, does it matter how many you have and how much of the body they're covering? Does adjuvant therapy help after total skin? Response rate for erythrodermic disease. 
Can we repeat total skin safely and does it work? And what about adjuvant photophoresis and the role of RT for localized cutaneous B cell lymphoma? Clinically useful classification system for CBCL. These are all questions that I had about 20 years ago when I was an intern at Yale in 1990, and I was actually on call in the intensive care unit my very first night as an intern, and the first patient I admitted was a patient with mycosis fungoides, and I had never heard of the disease before. This was about the state of our knowledge 20 years ago in terms of results of radiotherapy and cutaneous lymphoma. And this is just a cartoon. This was me in 1990 as an intern and a junior resident. And I show this slide for the students and house staff or uh, even some faculty in the audience. If you have something you're passionate about and you have an idea that you're really interested in, you should really pursue it. The problem for me was there were some folks who were naysayers who thought this is an unusual disease, this isn't worth studying, you're never going to be able to get enough patients. Um, but I would suggest that if you're passionate about something, uh, it's worth following through on. Uh, I don't look like this anymore and all these guys are gone. So. So let's, let's try to find the answers to some of these questions. Precursor lesions, are they prognostically significant? Well, in a series of about 150 patients who had received total skin electron beam, what we determined was is actually if you had an antecedent diagnosis of lymphomatoid papulosis or follicular mucinosis, you had a decreased disease-free survival. So this was important information for patients who would come to us who might be candidates for total skin because we know if you had these diseases, you weren't going to do as well. We don't know why, but the data were pretty strong. Adjuvant systemic therapies, well, in the early 90s and certainly in the 80s, we gave a lot of traditional systemic therapy for these patients. It was an indolent lymphoma, but there weren't many therapies available. But what we actually found was is that if you received total skin electron beam therapy, there was no benefit to traditional systemic therapy in those patients. Malignant melanoma and other second cutaneous malignancies, again, this was a relatively large study. All of these patients had received total skin, but a lot of patients would eventually recur and patients would receive supplemental localized radiotherapy fields. And so I was concerned about the possibility of second malignancies in these patients. Certainly PUVA and mechlorethamine put patients at risk for basal and squamous cell carcinomas, but fortunately what we found was is that additional RT on top of the total skin did not lead to second malignancies. Additional courses of radiotherapy. And the colors here are important, and I'm going to have a few more slides doing some comparisons. You see Wilson in blue and Becker and Hoppe from Stanford in a traditional Stanford-like coloration. This is an interesting story. So uh, we did a small paper on additional courses of total skin electron beam therapy and presented that at Astro in 1994, and it seemed to be well received. And what we found was is there was an excellent response rate nearly to the level of the first course of total skin electron beam therapy. Patients did better if there was a long disease-free interval, but total skin electron beam could be repeated if necessary if given in the manner in which we give it here at Yale and Stanford. Well, you see that the Becker-Hoppe Stanford paper was published in 1995 in the Red Journal, which is the Radiation Oncology Specialty Journal. I submitted my paper to the Red Journal. Um, end of 94, summarily rejected with extremely aggressive negative comments. So it was eventually published in the JAD in the dermatology literature. But what's really funny about this is I thought, well, you know, they didn't like it. One of the criticisms was there wasn't very many patients. We only had 14 patients in the study. Well, the Stanford paper had 15. So extent of skin involvement with T3. We have an excellent complete response rate for these patients, but if we stratified them based on percentage of skin involvement, based on the T1 and T2 patch plaque classification, if you had just a few tumors, 100% of these patients were actually disease-free at 18 months, and if you had more than 10%, all of the patients had relapsed by 18 months. But it wasn't as if this cohort didn't have an excellent response rate. This cohort also had a complete response rate of 76%. Adjuvant topical therapies. We had demonstrated that PUVA improves disease-free survival following total skin electron beam. And following our publication, the Stanford group, who really has a preference for nitrogen mustard, found similar findings. So when these two papers came out, we learned for the first time that it was absolutely essential for patients to have some sort of adjuvant maintenance therapy after total skin electron beam. When we used RT for localized lesions, we have excellent results, patients up to one to four lesions, CR rate of 95% with a disease-free survival at five to 10 years of 75%. So this is pretty good, especially that CR rate. Patients with whole body erythroderma, this is a major problem for these patients. They're extremely symptomatic. This was a very unusual series to have 45 patients, 
all receive total skin electron beam therapy without any neoadjuvant, concomitant, or adjuvant therapy. And remarkably, they had a 60% CR rate. Now, this was a clinical CR. Biopsies were not done in all of these patients. But a quarter of these patients were remarkably progression-free at five years based on clinical examination. On a slightly different cohort of about the same number of patients, the combination of photophoresis and total skin electron beam therapy, we found that the addition of ECP at some time, either prior to, during, or following the course, enhanced disease-free, progression-free, and cause-specific survival. I want to point out, though, that there's not an overall survival benefit here, and these data have been misquoted several times. There is a cause-specific survival benefit, though, but not overall. So this is sort of getting to the humor of how we don't have many patients to study. Shifting gears for a minute to another cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, remarkably there was absolutely nothing in the literature regarding how radiotherapy did for patients with localized CD30 anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So we published a very small series of patients, only eight, who received 40 gray, all had a CR, and all these patients were free of disease at 12 months. Stanford publishes similar data. Remember how they had 15 patients and I had 14 before? Well, now they have seven and I have eight. It's a very friendly coast-to-coast -coast competition. But looking at how these patients do, they probably do well no matter what we do, because this is a much larger series that James Yu, who's one of our junior faculty members, did recently, looking at several hundred cases from the SEER database. And only 33 of these patients actually received radiotherapy. But as you can see, the three-year relative survival is excellent at 97%. So let's shift over to cutaneous B-cell lymphoma. Primary cutaneous B-cell lymphoma treated with radiotherapy, a comparison of the EORTC and WHO classification systems, and then I'm going to talk about a lymphoma CBCL prognostic index. Well, the problem was many in the oncology community who did not have a lot of experience with cutaneous lymphoma would manage the disease based on nodal lymphoma principles and based on nodal histology, but this was a problem, and we wanted to try to reconcile this and come up with some data. So we had 34 patients who met the following criteria. All the patients were evaluated at Yale. All of them had been appropriately staged. All of them had primary treatment with radiotherapy. Biopsy specimens were, re -review were reviewed by two dermatopathologists here. And we classified these patients using both of these systems. So we had 34 patients. That was the dose range, median dose of 40 gray, median age of 60, a, a, a even split on gender. Most of the patients were white. Median symptom duration, eight months. And this is just a depiction of most of the patients had only one or two lesions. And in terms of skin sites, head and neck was very common. Extremities a little bit. The trunk, about a fifth of the patient. Legs, unusual. Multifocal, 15%. And I show this because this was not an unusual group of patients. If you look at the SEER series, which is much, much larger, the breakdown is almost identical. So our, our distribution of body was fairly typical. So when you look at this data based on WHO versus EORTC, if you had one of these patients and your pathologists were using the EORTC classification system at the time, you'd say, oh, this is follicular center cell. That's an indolent lymphoma. Everybody knows that. We can probably just use radiotherapy alone. But this is where the problem came up. If your group used the WHO system, you might classify these same patients as having diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which of course tripped a switch to say these patients maybe need combined modality therapy. But when you look at the results, and all of these patients were treated with radiotherapy alone, you can see the patients who might have been classified as diffuse large B-cell lymphoma had an excellent five-year survival and these patients had a superb complete response rate. But if you had diffuse large B-cell lymphoma leg type, these patients didn't do as well. But we didn't have the distinction back then based on immunohistochemistry of leg type, which is now, in 2010, a distinction that we can make based on histo, uh, immunohistochemical markers. And leg type doesn't have to be on the leg. In fact, a lot of the leg type lesions will present elsewhere. But when these lesions present on the lower extremities, they do worse. We have no idea why, and we do still often recommend combined modality therapy for these patients. So the bottom line is less than 36 gray revealed an increase in risk of local recurrence at five years of 50% versus 90% for those receiving greater than 36 gray. So we always try to give these patients at least 36, and there's really no reason that we can't ever do that. <clears throat> 
Localized radiotherapy is extremely effective and relatively non-toxic. And those who might be considered diffuse large cell in the WHO would be considered follicular center cell in the EORTC and would do well with RT alone. Now these systems have actually been reconciled so we don't see these sorts of problems generally, but uh, these were important findings because it made a major difference in management when this paper came out. This is just a slide showing a more global experience, and I show this to point out how well patients do with radiotherapy alone if they have localized cutaneous B-cell lymphoma. I want to point out these complete response rates. This isn't a surprise, but this is, uh, you know, superb information. Here is the Smith study. Ben Smith was one of our chief residents when this was done. And this series was 693. is really uh, a collection of data from around the world. But take a look over at the right, the five-year relapse-free survival. This disease is going to probably come back. Sometimes it comes back in the area that we treat, often it comes back in other locations. But the bottom line is that these folks can get excellent palliation and excellent response rates from radiotherapy. So we're winding up here, but one other issue I want to discuss is there were multiple classification systems based on nodal lymphoma and various pathological schemes that don't reconcile anatomic location when it comes to the patient with cutaneous B-cell lymphoma. So what we wanted to do is design a classification system accounting for histology, anatomic location that is non-biased, evidence-based, and was constructed based on a rigorous analysis. Because even six years ago, when I would sit down with a patient, we just didn't have any data to say, this is what your prognosis is going to be, whether I think you're going to be alive five years from now. We just didn't have the data. So this was a large series that was from the SEER database of over 1,000 patients with cutaneous B-cell lymphoma. And what we did was we assigned a hazard ratio of 1 to patients with any indolent histology and broke out these other subtypes based on the data. And you can see the hazard ratios here. And from this, we, discussed, we developed a prognostic index that was well, um, well sorted out based on statistical analysis. So if you had any indolent lesion, didn't matter where it was, you were in prognostic group 1A. If you had diffuse large B cell in a favorable location, not on the legs, for example, you were 1B, and you can see how the others follow. But what was important about this is when we discovered this, I could then sit down with a patient and actually have a reasonable discussion with them about their prognosis. And certainly we would learn that patients down in this category may require more aggressive therapy. But prior to this, we really didn't know. We didn't have any numbers to sit down and have discussions with patients. So in closing, we have excellent response rates with total skin electron beam therapy and localized RT for both cutaneous T cell and B cell lymphomas. There is no higher, th there is no therapy with a higher response rate for patients with total skin electron beam or local RT. Again, I'm not trying to convince anybody that it means that these responses are necessarily permanent or even long lasting, but there's no therapy which will get a patient into remission better than radiotherapy will. These patients can provide excellent palliation, and many, many of these patients have extraordinarily challenging symptoms and have had them for years until they get to us. Multidisciplinary management is absolutely critical. These patients are often very ill in advanced stages, and they're very complicated to take care of. Phase three trials are not probable, since these disease entities are extremely unusual. Diagnosis and therapy is extremely complicated, but we do have some investigational modalities that are on the horizon, but we feel at this point that the radiotherapy part of this package is well sorted out. And just wanted to list my collaborators in radiation oncology, dermatology, and medical oncology. Thanks very much.